its own raw beauty instead of what its original intention was. This is the Modern Domestique podcast, where each episode focuses on a different aspect of modern home economics. It's all about exploring a way of life that enhances our community and environment from where it all begins, in the home. My main hope is that this podcast encourages a new look at what modern home economics can be, and that these interviews empower you to make modern home economics your own in your home and your community. I'm Stacey Keating, and this episode is an interview with Denise Perrault, the founder and executive director of Art Parts Creative Reuse Center located in Boulder, Colorado. Art Parts is a nonprofit creative reuse center, which means that they accept donated reusable industry surplus, along with other art and craft materials, which they then resell at a low cost to the public. Founded in 2011, they are one of many creative reuse centers that can be found worldwide. You can think of a creative reuse center kind of like a thrift store for craft and art supplies. After a craft project, I often find myself with, say, just a small amount of yarn that seems a shame to throw away, but it's also not enough for another project that I have in mind. So places like Art Parts are a great resource for leftover supplies that you don't want to keep, but also don't want to throw away. I also especially appreciate that you can go there to just buy what you need, whether it be just a small amount of yarn or maybe one or two beads. I'm really excited to kick off season three of the podcast with this interview, and I hope that you'll be just as inspired as I was once you hear what Denise has to say. All right, would you introduce yourself? I'm Denise Perro. I'm the founder and executive director of Art Parts Creative Reuse Center and Bricolage Gallery in the commercial heart of Boulder, Colorado. Cool. So what exactly is Arts Parts? Art Parts Art Parts, okay is a nonprofit that accepts donated reusable industry surplus as well as arts, craft, and other creative materials from individuals to sell at low cost to everybody. Yeah, that's actually how I first found art parts is I was, you know, driving past, I was like, I wonder if they sell, you know, yarn or something for little projects. And I walked in and was blown away by the selection that you have here. And Do you think it's uh, made more fun and unusual by the fact that the whole store is organized by raw materials? Yeah. So here we are sitting by the glass and the metal section. There's also wood, paper, plastics, uh, a huge craft section, a fine art section, a whole room devoted just to fiber art. So there's that (laughs) yarn you were mentioning earlier. And then a section just for containers because all artists not just need them, but also love them. Yeah. So the reason we set it up that way is we want to encourage you to look at that mundane stuff like a piece of window screen, for example, in the metal section with fresh eyes to see it for its own raw beauty instead of what its original intention was. Yeah. I I think that makes the room uh, more fun than just your regular thrift store or arts Mm -hmm. and craft store. For sure, yeah. I mean, it's definitely inspiring, not only to see the gallery space that you have set up here, which we can get to in a minute, but, you know, also, you know, just kind of browse through and and just think of all the different things you can do with all these different objects and (laughs) things like that. It's so interesting to see, in particular, the industrial surplus, don't you think? We're lucky to have, for example, Ball Aerospace in town who now and again pulls up with a truck full of very lightweight, brightly colored uh, aluminum metals, some, you know, discs that say, for example, remove before flight. Wow. Uh, We also are lucky to have uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in town, who in the past has brought us things like 1980s full color, huge and beautiful bathymetric maps. Wow. Where else in town could you get maps of ocean floors? Right. Really? No place else. I know. We're lucky that we have uh, about 45 uh, general merchandise thrift stores throughout Boulder County, but we're really the only creative reuse center, and those thrift stores, they can't accommodate industry surplus. Mm-hmm. They're already overflowing with housewares and clothing. Mm-hmm. So you don't really find that interesting found no place else industry surplus 
uh, in any place but creative reuse centers. Yeah, yeah, and I think something that's really, I guess, inspiring to me as a maker, I guess, of different, like, crafty things um, is, you know, sometimes you'll have extra yarn, say, since we were talking about that. And, you know, you accept that not all the time because you get a lot of donations, but that is something that you accept. So rather than just, like, keeping it in my closet where it's just kind of hidden away, I could donate it here and someone else would be able to use that for their creative project. Right. Yeah, that's a good burden to have, Stacy, isn't it? Where sometimes we, the community has been so generous to us that our small 200 square foot intake room simply can't accommodate any any more. Mm-hmm. We are taking in uh, between one and two tons per month of surplus and arts and craft materials. Uh, and sometimes we simply can't keep up. Uh, thank you, generous donors. <laughs> but now and again, we do have to take a hiatus uh, because the space is finite. It's just yep. our our sad reality uh, that that's the way it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. But luckily, that means the, the shelves are always stocked and there's always new merchandise coming in and going out onto the sales floor. Yeah. And uh, mentioning those yarns, uh, we'll even take tiny balls of leftover yarn. Sometimes that's all a teacher or a maker needs is Mm -hmm. many small balls of of wool, for Mm -hmm. example, in many different colors, making pom-poms or who knows what. Right, yeah. So here you can get that at very low prices for small quantities. Yeah, which is great. A lot of the bins in the room, like the yarn balls, are just bulk priced. Uh, Here we are looking at a big uh, container of old keys, 20 (laughs) cents each. It would be impossible, right, to mark every key twenty with a little 20 cent price tag. (laughs) So there are a number of uh, bulk bins in the room. And that's because uh, that's one of the great things about the Reuse Center also is quantity. Mm -hmm. So uh, we now and again get dog tags from uh, animal control around the county. Well, you can make a cute pair of earrings with two dog tags, right? Right. But what could you do with 2,000 dog tags? Yeah. With all the different names and all the different colors, all metal, all meaningful in their way. Mm Mm-hmm. With a large quantity like that, uh, you have the ability to make something larger, certainly, but also with an impact and perhaps a message that wouldn't be possible with just two cute little dog tags. Right. So a lot of artists, especially installation artists and a lot of CU uh, art students and Europe art students, appreciate that large quant those large quantities yeah I could definitely see that um, what was the inspiration behind starting art parts uh, my husband works for a local window treatment company for many years and I would watch with dismay while in this case a two hundred dollar per yard a uh, leftover bolt of Italian brocade went into the dumpster. Oh, that's, that hurts. <laughs> so, yeah, that, exactly, right? As a textile artist, uh, that was disheartening. I knew they wanted to get rid of that uh, industry surplus in conscientious ways, but they didn't have the storage space, and they didn't have the manpower to find, oh, quilters, for example, or teachers or costume designers who could take that away in a truck. Industry bolts are often above 60 inches long, and in the case of Hunter Douglas, also down the road here in Boulder County, uh, can be 120 inch long bolts. Mm. Not all of us have a vehicle that can accommodate that, right? Yeah. Uh, So it occurred to me, one, I started calling uh, textile artists I knew and telling them, if you can arrive with a truck before 5 p.m. this Friday, You can have all the surplus um, fabric samples that you can cart away. Uh, But I often didn't have time for that either. Mm -hmm. So it occurred to me that I bet a lot of businesses deal with perfectly wonderful reusable surplus who also lack the storage space and the manpower to conscientiously dispose of it. 
which overwhelmingly most businesses, especially in Boulder County, want to do. Mm -hmm. They don't want to just throw it in the dumpster. They'd love to save the trash hauling fees and not put it in there and, and let it go into the hands of a teacher or artist or maker or inventor who could use it. They just lack the staff to, to do that. And so then I started researching ways, how, you know, how can we help businesses, how can we get business surplus into the hands of people like uh, teachers who could really use them? Mm -hmm. And I came upon Creative Reuse Centers online. Amazingly enough, they've been around since 1976. Wow. Uh, SCRAP in San Francisco, and that stands for Scrounger's Center for Reusable Art Parts. It was the very first one to open. Since then, uh, we were the 63rd to open in 2015. And as the fastest growing segment of the recycling sector in America, maybe the world, mm. uh, there are now about 70 creative reuse centers across the U.S. and reuse centers popping up in places as far away as Australia. Wow, that's great. Um, you mentioned earlier that it's the art part is a nonprofit. Yes. Um, what exactly does that mean for this business? It means we all worked for free for the first two and a half to three years. It means the landlord in Pricey Boulder gets nearly three quarters of our profits because rent is expensive in downtown Boulder. And it means every dollar uh, we earn here. Uh, everything that's sold, all that money goes right back into supporting this community benefit, which ultimately, that's why we started it. Yeah, it's We're just giving it back to the community. Uh, the dollars that you bought on, oh, jewelry findings and, oh, pieces of uh, stainless steel cuts from the local loom manufacturer, that goes into paying our insurance, our rent, our bills, our intake manager, our, our assistant store manager, and a small salary for me as executive director. Wow. That's cool. I think that the community really appreciates it, for sure. I'm glad. They, they do seem to. The community has not only been generous with donations, certainly, but they have been very supportive. It's been wonderful to see how Boulder County has embraced a creative reuse center. Yeah. Um, can we talk a little about the KonMari movement that's happening, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of the Netflix show with Marie Kondo and her books and things like that. Um, has that impacted your donations at all? Has that gone up? Uh, well, for us, we usually uh, see January and uh, early February as uh, big donation months for us. In fact, January is traditionally one of our biggest donations. Interesting. But I would say I've seen a little uptake like most of the uh, thrift stores across the county because of the show, mm -hmm. which is great, right? Because we want people to really take a look at their overconsumption. Mm -hmm. That's why in the room here, we let you open any bag or box and just take out the quantity you need. Go to Michael's or Hobby Lobby. You might just need two beads for that mm -hmm. project, but you have to buy 200. Yep. Here, you can just open up and take out those two beads if that's all you need. So that's part of the problem why we all have too much stuff. Fast fashion, uh, we don't deal with uh, fashion except for uh, antique fur coats and furs for the most part. Uh, but that's a huge issue mm -hmm. uh, where we're almost all of us over consume. Yep. Uh, all have too much clothes uh, that we're half of or more we're probably not using in our closets so that is always a, a huge donation to general merchandise thrift stores and just our excess consumerism in general we really need to start looking at what we're buying and what we need as opposed to what we want mm -hmm. really seriously taking a look at sorry to be blunt but the crap we are producing, mm -hmm. and do we really need to spend precious natural resources 
on an ugly little figurine that says world's best granddad <laughs> right. i'm pretty sure we don't yeah but unless that's the one thing that truly does bring you know granddad's joy, joy or something yes. right you know if but that, that you know a hundred of them maybe not <laughs> yes grandpa figurine sparks joy for you well then yeah. Yeah, go for it yeah but for the most part uh what we make ourselves from our heart yeah like i'm pretty sure that that granddad would much rather have something handmade and more meaningful and Mm -hmm. perhaps simpler from his grandchild than that ugly little figure. (laughs) Just guessing. Yeah. And I know that she also has said to throw things away. Um, you know, and, and I guess I come back to like the tiny little bits of yarn and, you know, extra beads and things like that, which would be so easy just to throw in the trash can and be done with it. Um, but I think that that's one great thing, uh, one great service that our parts provides to the community is to be able to avoid those things going into a landfill. Right. So while Marie Kondo does promote or does suggest throwing things away and those of us in materials management that makes us cringe a little but there is some things that even we have to toss sometimes Mm -hmm. so I get how there there are those things Mm -hmm. that there there's no uh, there's no end market for some plastic still and some other things thrift stores don't want stained and ripped clothing for Mm -hmm. example they Mm -hmm. can't sell it you're just pushing your trash onto that hardworking thrift store. Mm -hmm. So things like that. However, uh, it's good for all of us to know that uh, in Boulder County, at least, at the CHARM, uh, also known as the Center for Hard to Recycle Materials, there's a giant bin where you can bring that ripped and torn and stained clothing, and it will be reused into uh, industrial rags, and shredded into other things. So instead of throwing that stuff in the trash can, consider that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know if that includes things like underwear? Because I know it underwear does. are tough to get rid of. Yeah. Uh, their only stipulation is that it be clean for the most part. Cool. And even a, a permanent stain in an otherwise clean piece of fabric mm-hmm. or a small hole in a giant queen sheet mm-hmm. that can be worked around and that material still reused. That's great. That's a really great resource. Yeah, so I would encourage people to not throw that stuff away, to look at their local recycling centers or uh, transfer stations and make it easy for you to separate out what can be composted or uh, reused or brought to a thrift store or made into your own home rags. Mm -hmm. Why throw out that those stained T-shirts yep. when you could be using those instead of paper towels in your home? Yep, I do that all for the time. Example. Yeah, good yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice. Awesome. I know. Yeah, it's really funny. I'll come across um, T-shirts when I lived in Paris. I worked in a bar for a little while, and so I had bar T-shirts. And um, I've made most of those into rags now because um, I was wearing them for, like, night T-shirts or whatever. And um, and it's fun to, like, grab one and be like, oh, here's the Budweiser T-shirt or whatever. Sure. Um, you they know, so also like, make uh, great rags for uh, weavers like myself who love rag rugs made oh, right. out of sturdy cottons. They're colorful. They can be cut into strips and used for making other stuff. Uh, it's stunning and inspiring what can be made out of the most humblest of uh, secondhand goods mm. uh, with just a little creativity, time, and imagination. Yeah. So I guess that makes me think of the art space, the art gallery that you have here. Can mm-hmm. you talk a little bit about the inspiration behind that and what type of artists show here? And things? Sure. So uh, we have an in-house gallery right inside Art Parts. In fact, you have to pass through it to get to the regular shop. It's called bricolage gallery, and bricolage means literally using the materials at hand. We, we feel an art gallery is important in this space because it's important to provide inspiration for children and adults in this room filled with possibilities. So that's what the gallery is about. The parameters for uh, national to international artists is that all material, all works must be made with a minimum of 60% reclaimed materials. It doesn't have to be from art parts. It can be from the woods. It can be found objects. Uh, It can be hair clippings like the artist we have uh, in our show, our gallery right now. 
He has included some hair clippings uh, in, his, in one of his paintings. Uh, and so basically any artist who uses at least more than half reclaimed materials is invited to submit uh, images for, for us to look at and to possibly feature in the gallery. The gallery also allows us not just to feature reclaimed bricolage, mixed media, and assemblage artworks, and we are one of just three galleries in the whole country to specialize in those genres, but it allows us to support local and national and international reclaimed material artists. That's great. It, yeah. is, it is the fastest growing art genre on the planet. It's as if, Stacy, we finally figured out the beauty in the mundane mm -hmm. and are, are experimenting and exploring it as an artistic medium. Mm -hmm. In some kind, in in some cases, with breathtaking results. Yeah, yeah, I really think that's true, and I mean the whole genre of the found objects and things like that. I think um, is really inspiring because people do take all sorts of everything and just make beautiful works of art or really interesting pieces of clothing or you know whatever it may be. Right. And what's great about the whole art genre too is it's so accessible mm. to everybody. A seven-year-old can glue and cut up straws and make something interesting. Uh, the same way, a like our current artist, a 91-year-old artist who has exhibited all over the world, who is still prolific and still finding inspiration in the humblest of objects to include into his world-renowned paintings. Yeah, and I mean, also talk about opening yourself up to the joy of every day, too, because if you start looking at objects around you as found art objects, even if you're not inspired to use it for anything yourself, um, but just having that mindset of looking, being aware of what's around you and mm -hmm. what makes you smile um, or, or catches you off guard or whatever it may be, you know, what a great way to kind of walk through life, too. That's why I love the name of the current show, uh, Arthur Secunda's show that's up through April 6th right now. It, the name of it is Everyday Magic. How appropriate is that to the sculptures and uh, two three-dimensional paintings we're looking at in the room right now Yeah. Uh, for how this prolific, like I said, na uh, internationally claimed artist sees the humblest of objects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I mean, great. Would, would you consider adding your own hair clippings from your latest haircut in a painting? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I that could be so. that cool, yeah. right? <laughs> I'll, I'll include many other things, but <laughs> it's funny how many of us have a kind of ishy reaction to mm. leftover hair. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's funny. Well, it, that makes me think of like the original rugs were made of goat hair and things like that. You know, so I think that I don't know, through technology and years and modernization, we've lost a lot of that knowledge maybe and a lot of the connection to the things around us and the reusability of the things around us. Um, but, you know, I, I work with goats too, um, and I often think of trying to make a rug out of their hair, and it's really daunting. I couldn't even imagine. Yeah. Uh, well, mohair goats, mm -hmm. that's one kind of goat that mm -hmm. has a long staple or individual uh, hair mm -hmm. length. Uh, and uh, cashmere yep, coats. And right. We've been using them for years. Ooh, to have a rug or anything. Ooh, right. Coats, <laughs> I'll take right? a sweater. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> one of my favorite fibers, personally. Uh, but uh, you're absolutely right. It, look at even our grandparents. Yep. So, you know, we're, we're in our middle ages mm -hmm. ourselves, right? Uh, our grandparents, people who went through the Depression, et cetera, or just savvy thrifty folks have always utilized and reutilized all the small things mm -hmm. that they used. So, for example, I think of uh, when I was in the Peace Corps in Tunisia, North Africa, in the early 90s, once a piece of clothing was no longer suitable as clothing, those people in my village would cut it into strips and they chinked their entire home with it. Hmm. Simple homes made out of mud and daub or cement blocks stuffed 
with old rags or bits of paper wow. or a small bit of that plastic bread bag, mm-hmm. literally whatever was around to help insulate to insulate their homes wow. and their beds or mm-hmm. their the corners that they slept in, mm-hmm. etc. So we could learn a lot from the way our grandparents and uh, other resourceful people on the planet use every available resource. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, earlier you were talking about, you know, a seven-year-old doing something creative. Um, and I wanted to talk about, uh, the little parties that you can throw here with kids. Can you tell me about that? uh, We offer make and take parties and we've given them so far from ages six to 36. Wow. Uh, So not just kids. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There's, uh, uh, I'm thinking uh, in particular of one group of uh, 30-year-olds. Mm-hmm. It was her choice to have her, her six best pals uh, create something mean- meaningful uh, addressing the next decade. Mm-hmm. So as 30, what does 30 through 39 look like for all her oh, similar aged uh, friends who mm-hmm. joined that party? So you can bring your cake and an ice cream and whatever you like. We supply the instructor, all the materials, and for two hours, you get to make something uh, within a theme of your choice. Have a little party. The mess stays here. The glitter goes on our floor. <laughs> Important. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to worry about that um, maker's uh, mess in your space. Mm-hmm. I, we charge $14 a child, a uh, little more if the class is expanded or, or you want some extras. Uh, and those are those are pretty popular. Yeah, is it something where the idea is talked about of what's going to be made ahead of time? Yeah, on our website, our link to our make and take parties, we offer six themes that parents and children can choose from to spark some ideas. But if you have your own idea of something you would like to create, we let you speak directly with the instructor prior to the class, mm-hmm. and often we can accommodate that special request. That's great. Um, do you have any advice if someone's listening to this podcast from somewhere across the world and is inspired to start their own creative reuse center? Do you have any advice for them on how to start? Um, I do. And it's heartening that I received a number, perhaps six requests for this very question, the answer to this very question in just, oh, 2018. Wow. That people come in and they're so inspired to have a place like this in their own community that they too want to start it. Uh, the, the first advice I would give is expect it to take about four years from bright idea to sign and a brick and mortar space that says now open to the public. Mm. It, take, it took me a year just to build a board of directors. Wow. If you're going to be a nonprofit, you need that. You need those people behind you helping out as the founder and or executive director. You can't possibly do it all yourself. So finding good people t- took me a, about a year. Uh, also, you need to apply for a 501c3. You need that those federal tax ID numbers and that federal designation to become a nonprofit. That takes a little while. Uh, and you need time for serious networking across your community. You need to start immediately building community support with your community members. I started by going to monthly uh, green drinks meetup groups, Mm -hmm. uh, a national sustainability group that just brings together like-minded, environmentally conscious folks. And they were a huge help. I went to every city council meeting that had anything to do with sustainability or environmental stewardship, and I just chatted up an idea for a creative reuse center looking for people who could help move the idea forward. Mm. That's perhaps the most crucial thing. you got to be willing to go out there in your community and build local support for the idea. And then it'll grow organically from there. That and your well-written, well-thought-out business plan. <laughs> <laughs> that thing. I heard I was the only one, one of the few people in the creative reuse world to write a business plan. Because wow. so many spaces did start organically, 
Uh, so I've been sharing that uh, from Hawaii to last week, uh, Boise, Idaho. Oh, wow. So hopefully uh, those communities will, will soon have creative reuse centers uh, to, to be proud of as well. So that would be my advice. Uh, luckily, the creative reuse industry is supported by a wonderful national organization called the Reuse Alliance. Mm. They offer biannual uh, reuse conferences where you can go and meet many of your peers and move forward. Pittsburgh Center for Creative Reuse also has a fabulous link on their website to all the other creative reuse centers across the country where you can start calling and emailing other executive directors for help and support and mentorship. We're all quite close, and we, we're all we're 100% female-powered, wow. except for uh, a new one in Denver, so it's great to see some dudes coming to the <laughs> uh, But we're, we're overwhelmingly uh, women, and we're all very supportive of each other. Reach out to any of us, and you're sure to, to find some help and and support. That's great. I love that even nationally and maybe even internationally, this community is a community. Yes. It's helpful to yeah, each yeah. other. And I couldn't have written the business plan or uh, in some weeks even had the courage to move forward mm. if I hadn't received support and mentorship from uh, my fellow Creative Reuse Center uh, executive directors. The other thing that was crucial for me, at least, was I spent four years volunteering at a local thrift store to learn the reusables business. I specifically went in and asked the sales manager if she would mentor me with my end goal in mind. She was very happy to do that. I learned so much from her, uh, and it gave me the courage to know after four years, I can do this. I know how to run this. I know how to handle donations. Unlike regular thrift stores, we weigh every donation that comes in because mm. we really want to know our waste diversion impact in solid, real numbers. Mm. So that's uh, something I added, knowing that the, the reuse and materials management world does that, whereas thrift stores don't really pay attention to the, the tonnage or pounds they're taking in. Yeah. It, that's rather unusual. But for creative reuse centers... It's a, it's a part of our daily routine. Wow. And it's good to know. It helps to have that number when you apply for grants or when you have to turn down a station wagon full of knitting magazines from the 70s and 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Which might be fun to browse through every now and then, but Very maybe... Very <laughs> fun, yes, but sometimes we already have a station wagon full right. of knitting magazines from the 70s and 80s, <laughs> and we have to say no to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, well, just kind of a final fun thing to talk about. What are some of the your favorite or most inspiring, I guess, projects that you've heard of people making through the things that they found here or seen mm. yourself? Uh, there's, there's a teacher in town who routinely comes and buys up all of our acrylic eyeglass lenses that are donated by my local optometrist in town. Hi, wink optical. <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink. Yes, wink, wink. Uh, that teacher had them cut out pictures of insects. So they learned about the insects while they were looking at the, the beauty, really, of an insect. And some of the bifocal lens and other lenses provide a, a magnifying quality. Oh, interesting. And so you would see a, a portion of those images exaggerated or amplified, magnified, whereas maybe the head or the thorax was in actual size. So it's really inspiring to see what some of the younger younger grade teachers come up with uh, mm. for their children to do. Another one I found really fascinating was somebody who's buying up a bunch of our old family slides. We get thousands of slides. Wow. And, uh, and trying to jump ring them together to create a shower curtain. Oh, wow, how cool. So as the cool. light went through them at, at different times and in different places, it would illuminate different uh, slides. Mm. I thought that was extremely clever. Yeah. And a great use of uh, old old family slides. Definitely. Gosh, uh, Stacy, there's so many. 
Uh, even something as simple as buying an old wood picture frame, mm -hmm. but you're not using it to frame a piece, that's your tapestry then. Yeah. So people looking for those sorts of things, seeing innately yeah. the other uses for things like picture frames for use as a tapestry then, mm -hmm. for example. Continually inspired uh, by people stretching their imagination and creativity in those ways. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you, Denise, so much for sitting down with me. And I'll put the links to everything up on the blog with some photos and everything. Thank you, um, Stacy. I appreciate you uh, having such an interest uh, in our place and wanting to support us. Appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. If, if anybody has uh, any further questions about us, you can always contact us at www artpartsboulder.org check out our links at the top uh, see what's happening at, in, in Bricolage Gallery on that link and our shop number is 720-379-5328 and I always welcome phone calls there thank you so much thank you Stacy. thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Modern Domestic Podcast and a big thanks to Denise for today's conversation to learn more about art parts, head over to the Modern Domestique website to check out the blog post that goes along with this podcast episode. I've also put all the links to the blog post and to art parts directly in the show notes to this episode. Up next in Season 3 is an interview with Hayden from Boulder Food Rescue, so make sure to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a thing. And if you like this podcast, please take the time to tell a friend or leave a rating or a review in the podcast app of your choice so that other people can find this podcast too. It really does make a difference to help others find this podcast. Also, this season I'm planning an Ask the Modern Domestique episode, so please email me with any modern home economics questions you may have. I'll put the link to my email in the show notes as well. And as always, I'd love to hear about your takeaways from today's episode, so please make sure to stay in touch on the website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks again for tuning in, and have a very modern domestique day.